and good morning, everyone. Thank you uh, so much for taking the time out of your schedules to join this truly exciting webinar. Um, from Uganda, from the Netherlands, and of course, across East Africa. Uh, as Tim just mentioned, it is great to see both familiar faces and, and new ones, as I think together you make up the real drivers of the aquaculture sector. So it's fantastic that you take the time out of your schedule to be here. Um, on behalf of the Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, based out of Kampala, and of course, La Rive International and Sigma Capital, we've been allowed to uh, assess the aquaculture sector in Uganda. And of course, identify the most interesting opportunities for Dutch companies, knowledge institutes, but also local investors. So what we want to do today is really share some of the key findings and the opportunities in the Ugandan aquaculture sector. So what we'll provide you is insights and trends and developments, but also a look into production, growth, and some of the highlights uh, brought forth in the report. Um, naturally, it's not all smooth sailing, so bottlenecks and uh, challenges will, of course, also be addressed together with some of the instruments which are available for potential investors. So as you know and have been going through for the last two years, I think any quality webinar truly depends on some real practical matters. So with that, I will thank you again for your presence and hand over to Laura, who will take us through some of the practicals of the webinar to assure audibility is good and you're able to follow, but also to assure interactivity. And she will then continue to introduce today's speakers. So with that, thank you again for your presence, and we look forward to a very interactive webinar. Laura. Thank you, Wouter, for the great introduction. Good morning, everyone. My name is Laura. I'm a project manager at La Rive International, and today I'll be your webinar host. First, as Wouter already addressed, I would like to address some practical matters. You are all automatic, you automatically muted. Please keep it that way. Feel free to share thoughts, questions, impressions in the chat. Um, the organizer will share a screen today. That is Tim. He will introduce himself later. And you are advised to keep your camera turned off. This improves the connection to make sure we are all able to understand what is being said. The webinar is being recorded. So if anyone would like to review it or send it to someone else who wasn't able to attend, just let me know and I will send you the link. Also, the full report of the research is available upon request after the webinar. During the uh, webinar, I will keep an eye on the chat and collect all the questions for the speakers to answer at the Q&A at the end of the session. So now I would like to introduce the people who have collaborated on this research. First of all, the research was commissioned by the Embassy of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, like Wouter already mentioned. And therefore, we would like to thank Josefat, who is a Senior Policy Officer for Food Security and Agribusiness, and Steven, who is a Senior Advisor Trade Investment and Economic Di Diplomacy, for their support during the research. We would also like to take the opportunity to introduce the agricultural attaché Frank Wuyser, who will also be speaking today. And he will, during the webinar, provide more information about ways they can support development initiatives. Before I will introduce the research team, I would like to ask all of you if you would like to, uh, what, what, what are your key takeaways for this webinar? Please share these, uh, share your thoughts in the chat. And we are curious about what you would like to take away from this webinar. So please, we encourage you to share this in the chat. This roadmap for sustainable value chain development in the Uganda and agriculture sectors has been created by Asigma Capital Advisory Services. So part of the research team is Luisa Akiror. She is a manager of strategy training and partnerships at Asigma Capital Advisory Services. And together with Tim de Cruijff, who is an emerging market advisor at the Reef International, they took the lead in this research. They will also be the presenters of today. And uh, it's time to start the webinar. Tim, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Laura. Really appreciate it. Indeed, for the last months, uh, me and the team uh, have been diving into the agriculture sector. Most of the research conducted in the fall of last year. And we believe that the sector offers really good opportunities for private sector development and investment in general. 
Today, we would like to present these findings to you, starting with some key facts and a market overview of Uganda itself. Then we'll go in a bit more detail on the value chain, present different development opportunities. And as Laura just mentioned, we'd like to ask you to reserve your questions as at the end, we'll host a Q&A session and try to answer as many questions as we can. With me today is Luisa. Uh, she's been heading the field team from the ground. Um, and for to start us off, I would like to ask her to give a bit of background on Uganda and the setting that we're currently in. All right. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be speaking to you right out of Kampala. Louisa is my name, as mentioned, and I will be giving you a bit of context on Uganda and why the fisheries uh, sector is important to us right now. As you all know, Uganda, the Pearl of Africa, is predominantly an agricultural um, um, country, and historically, fish has always been quite, quite important to us. As of 2021, we have a population of about 46 million people, and um, almost half of that is below the age of 15, showing that we have a growing uh, demographic dividend or persons that are potentially going to be moving into the working age um, um, segment or category, and will have some kind of disposable income to um, utilize. We also see quite a bit of urban growth happening within the country. And that is because of the need to move from the rural areas towards the urban spots. And what the country has uh, done in the recent past is to introduce more cities where you can have more people moving towards that. And just like any other um, city, once you, any other country, once you have more cities available to persons, then you have more opportunities for employment, more resources available, more incomes and definitely disposable incomes at, at um at play. In regards to our economy, um, Uganda's GDP is still small, 910. Uh, that is mainly centered around uh, the capital city, Kampala. But as I had said, regionally, we are seeing a spread towards the west and the east, um, two primary areas in which fisheries are actually present. Uh, because of the pandemic, we took a dip of some sort, and, and that was mainly because the key sectors that contribute to that GDP, so tourism, education, and real estate, I, I mean, re retail and manufacturing actually dropped. But we're seeing that these moves have, uh, this has now taken up uh, a different turn. It's now growing, and this is mainly because of the opening up of the um, economy at the start of the year. So we're definitely seeing some improvement in terms of economic conditions within the country. Um, over the last couple of years, fish and fish uh, products have been a key contributor to the export basket um, after gold and coffee. Uh, mainly this is from wild catch, but uh, within the last three to four years, we've seen a good indication of growth between the pond and cage culture that have also contributed to this um, export. And um, throughout this webinar, Tim will be sharing the true, true potential that is going to be coming out of the country in regards to this. Over to you, Tim. Thank you so much, Louisa. Fascinating to see what the growth is in this country and how fast it's, it's developing. Uh, really, every time I visit, it seems that there has been another leap in development if I when I enter Uganda. Uh, when we go more towards the agriculture, the topic of the day, um, I think many of you are um, uh, present today might be familiar with the, the official figures, the FAO figures that we often see. Um, and there it's generally presented that Uganda is the third um, agriculture producer in Africa after Egypt, after Nigeria. It tends to be um, Uganda with about 100,000 metric tons of production. Um, those are these official figures um, presented by FAO and others. For this study, we looked into a bit more detail in what's really there on the ground, because um, a significant proportion of this total production uh, is supposedly due from pond production. Uh, officially, 25,000 ponds are registered in the country. However, from the onset of the study, it, there were clear signals that many of these ponds might not be 
actually in use. So we looked deeper at the entire sector and the reality on the ground. And of course, there's still quite some uncertainty, but by talking to district fisheries officers and by going out in the field, um, we observed quite limited pond production actually active with many of these ponds not being in use or very low levels of commercializations. And that's really resulted in us rescaling our estimate of the total production in uh, the country. Um, we say that uh, between 800 to two and a half thousand metric tons of pond production is present instead of the general higher estimate that we see. And we think we have uh, one of the reasons why that might be true is the reason why pond farming is, tends to be started uh, in Uganda. Pond farming is very much promoted through the Operation Wealth Creation, a government provided uh, supported program where farmers are started uh, off the farming with starter feeds, with fingerlings, with a pond. And uh, they are given the materials to start farming for the first few months but what we really see in the on the field is that after these first few months uh, when the starter feeds run out when the first feeds run out these farmers are not able to actually continue farming and far and many of the ponds that were officially started um, become dysfunctional uh, so that might be one of the reasons why um, those pond figures are lag lagging behind however when we really look at the other side and then we're talking about cage farming. We're seeing actually an, an observing a very rapidly growing culture uh, sector uh, with increased investment and interest where the numbers might be higher than what you would find in the uh, official uh, FAO estimates. And these cage farms are both in terms of the large farms with uh, often foreign investment, as well as a segment of growing uh, small to medium sized cage farmer and together we really see this this uh, burgeoning cage farming sector over the last 10 years really driving the sector forward uh, increasing overall production and here the official figures might seem to be lagging behind the rapid situation on the ground um, in 2020 we believe cage farming to be around 35,000 metric tons and in 2021 that's already between the 40,000 and 50,000 metric tons. And we base this information on conversations that we've had in the field, it's primarily with the Ugandan Commercial Fish Farmers Association, but we also cross-referenced this data with satellite imagery, um, where we mapped all the different cages um, and used an object detection model to see what is actually there on the ground, input from sector experts, and as well as data from imports and others. But of course, these uh, pre figures presented here today are our best guess estimate. Um, and the situation on the ground remains fluid, remains uh, vague. But we believe that production probably in the country right now is between 40,000 and 50,000 metric tons and is rapidly growing. And when we look at what kind of fish is being produced, it's predominantly tilapia, um, which makes sense with cage farming, of course. But the real reason why catfish isn't really taking off within the country is uh, low consumer demand within the uh, country itself and technical challenges faced by far farmers to grow catfish due to cannibalism and other aspects and uh, lack of availability of fingerlings. So we're really seeing a grown cage culture dominated by, by tilapia. Um, and it's quite exciting how fast that is growing. Um, in the report, we've detailed a bit more as well how we've estimated these figures. Uh, I'm sure that many of you here today are quite keen on knowing how it is in the report. You can find more information on that as well. And if we then look at how this production is sort of spread out across the country. Well, of course, given that we see that quite a lot of production is cage culture, a lot of it is centered around Lake Victoria, uh, the predominant farming region. Um, with a bit around Lake Albert. And we see the pond farming is a bit more spread out across the country, but again, also around Lake Victoria because there's the best access to inputs there. We see most pond production there as well. Um, if we're looking at what are some of the key players that we've observed in the market today, we see a number of hatcheries, but clearly not enough 
to meet the demand in the country, uh, primarily uh, tilapia hatcheries, some producing for internal supply, some for uh, third-party supply. You can see the uh, Intorok Springs Farm uh, hatchery and uh, all the way in the east, we observed farmers traveling all the way from the west to get their fingerlings. So it's it's uh, if you have a uh, knowing Uganda, it's a huge distance that we're talking about here to just get quality fingerlings. Um, feed supply is dominated by uh, by import. Um, the cage farmers want floating uh, feeds, and we see very few domestic players, and we see really these imported brands leading with uh, Kauta Escafica, many of them present here today. They're doing an excellent job in the country by making feed available um, and are leading uh, in the sector as well in terms of brand recognition and uh, and also their distribution network. Um, only players such as Yuga Chick and Afokai are, are producing domestically, uh, but they're struggling quite some, what we'll get to a bit later. Um, and in terms of the farming landscape, which we'll get in a bit to, we see a few larger farmers and a considerable segment of these mid and small size producers. Um, if we then talk about what is the sizes in terms of consolidation, and this is really a rough estimate, we estimate that the top five farmers probably jointly produce between 10 to 20% of the total farm fish production. But again, this is difficult to determine. It's based on all the information that we have present. So that's what we're really seeing here. Production uh, concentrated around Lake Victoria, a number of international players starting to be on the market, lots of imported uh, feed and a number of key players growing rapidly. If we look a bit more to the structure of this cage farming, right? The element that is really uh, driving the sector and in the aquaculture uh, sector in general, we're seeing kind of a dual segment uh, emerge a dual sector. So where on the one hand, we see pond farming not really getting off the ground, faced by uh, structural challenges, we're seeing a rapidly developing gate sector, an increasing drive of professionalization, where a number of larger actors have entered the market. Um, we're talking here, for example, Yalelo, uh, uh, or existing ac actors expanding quite significantly in the recent years, talking something uh, as Source of the Nile, for example, part of Lake Harvest Group. And these players are really professionalizing the value chain, increasing standards, and bringing down the cost of products. Um, we I think it's a good to mention, for example, really what Yalelo is doing here is really developing the domestic market. It's got uh, fish outlets throughout the country, really rapidly growing, growing the demand for for these premium fish, developing consumer market because uh, using effective marketing because we still see that the overall consumption of fish is still somewhat low uh, if you compare it to the world average in Uganda. Um, and these larger far firms often act as an integrated company, have distribution, fingerlings, import their feed directly. But just as we see a dual sector between pond and cage farming, we also see dual sector within the cage farm. So we have these, these larger far, farms that I just mentioned that have been growing considerably, that are integrated, that have access to many of their inputs through their own uh, integrated supply chain. And then we have this segment of smaller and mid-sized cage farms. And it's a growing group, but they do currently lack access to quality inputs, knowledge, even market from time to time. Um, and this is constraining growth. What we just mentioned, there's very few hatcheries producing for third parties, for example. Uh, we see that these players have to buy feed from distributors and others, which is significantly increasing their production cost. Um, and what we see is that this is constraining growth. And we also see quite a boom and bust cycle in this segment with many people starting and leaving the industry again uh, within around five year cycles. So it's growing this small and medium segment, but there are uh, constraints there that really need to be removed for that uh, sector, part of the sector also to really develop over time. Um, in 2019, many of these players also actually left the sector because it was flooding of the shores of Lake Victoria, which resulted in quite some uh, players exiting the market as well. Um, so in short, we see a dual sector emerge, both in pond and cage farming as well 
as between the smaller mid-sized players and the larger cage farmers. And for the coming period, we'll have to see these smaller and mid-sized players have to professionalize in order to remain competitive. And we'll need investments in supportive in, uh, in infrastructure for these players, such as hard hatcheries, if we really want that sector to grow together as an industry. Um, if we look at the overall growth expectance based upon the plans of just the major players as well as the others, we're expected the growth to continue, of course, not at the dramatic rate that you can see on the left there, uh, nearly 50% growth over the last years. We're expecting that to slow down a bit, but still to be considerable, especially if you look at the plans already in place, it's going to be um, quite high still. Uh, coming back to that rift, the dual sector, we actually see that as well in the current installed cages, similar pattern. Um, on the right, you can see all the cages that we identified using satellite imagery. So we uh, identify a uh, use satellite imagery and object detection model to map the different cages. Of course, this, this should be seen more as a minimum because with cloud cover and other elements, there might be some that we missed. And we really saw that at the linear cage, these smaller cages, the model wasn't able to distinguish there. So there's probably a lot more really small cages as well that might not be uh, fully captured here. But what we do see is this um, rift between the bigger ones. We see a number of bigger cages coming on, where 10 years ago would be mainly homemade cages, small cages. We're really seeing these bigger HDPE cages being imported, coming in 20 diameters, really growing from, from this sector. Um, and we see this reflected in the figures right now. So we see quite some development there in, in the farming systems used and, and, and what have you. And again, this difference between uh, the sectors there. And if we look at the market for the fish, uh, although it's expanding hand in hand with the growing middle sector just mentioned by Louisa, the formal retail mar uh, uh, market for fish is still quite small, a uh, few supermarkets and others. Uh, however, just mentioned major players are looking uh, to develop this sector and the impact of growth that we can observe in the agriculture sector can also be already be seen in the ground and i just want to ask louisa to share some more light on that as well all right um thank you tim um in terms of you know what's showing the growth within the country um what's showing on the ground in terms of development what has happened in the sector or that has happened in the consumer markets that can show that the sector is actually growing is, for example, that the, fa the fact that the fish is still the largest export um, that I had mentioned earlier. And it, we definitely have that growing if we have a consistent um, growth in cage. Um, we will also have um, consistent export of the farmed fish um, being exported to neighboring countries like Kenya and DRC as it is happening right now. Another thing is also to see that government has made fisher, uh, fisheries a, a priority. Uh, we can see multiple developments that have been made in that space. Number one, you have a district fisheries officer for every district. So certain districts have been set aside for commercial aquaculture, but they've gone beyond these 31 districts and made sure that there is a technical resource available to those that are interested in getting into the sector. Another thing I would say that has shown that, you know, the government is putting this as a priority is that they've made amendments to the current law that had dated back to the 1960s, and we'll be speaking lightly about that. It is also to see that they are providing fish inputs and resources to help those who would like to, be, to engage, especially in pond culture. I think that that is also one of those indicators of what you could say is encouraging um, aquaculture to develop. And, and definitely incentives for investment, mainly around um, the possibility of importing um, agricultural inputs uh, tax-free. In terms of the consumer market, I will speak to two things. Uh, Tim mentioned uh, the fact that there are now retail outlets. This is a trend that we saw within the poultry sector as well. Initially, um, poultry was never available in you know, set aside um, outlets, but now we see that becoming a trend. And this was mainly because there was an up, a growing urban market that needed to find uh, poultry available at a certain price in certain, you know, SKGs. Um, and this, we see that uh, Sun, uh, Sun and Yalelo have done that within 
um, the center. But also uh, what's key to note is the fact that if you take a, an, an evening walk or if you drive through peak traffic, you will see that the bottom of the pyramid are also being um, availed fish in, in smaller sizes, deep fried, something that they can purchase uh, with the income that they've made for the day, which is about $2. And by making fish an alternative for animal protein, we definitely see that that will be um, moving the sector ahead. Um, lastly, I would say that um, we are seeing a, a bit of a trend in how it's being integrated. A long time ago, fish was um, kept for you know two to three tribes in particular areas. Now, fish can be found in most eateries, in most restaurants. You find it blended into meals that you typically would use other animal proteins and this change is not only because of cage culture i think it's also because of um, just a growing uh, sector that desires to see fish uh, consumed by all over to you team thank you louisa indeed the government has put quite some things in place to support the sector really good to see and really good to see some of those supportive frameworks put in there as well. Important to mention um, their role in the development of the last years as well. Um, if we look a bit at the feed landscape, I know quite some people present today or might be particularly interested in that. Um, we see that if we look a bit more detailed into the feed market, the so the aqua feed market, for Uganda, we see that cage farming is again driving the total growth in commercial feeds. Cage farmers only use floating fish feeds combined with some supplementary feeding of caladina shrimp and others by some farmers. Um, and aligned with the increase in cage production, we also observe an increase in the uh, feed market seen in the import figures as Ugandan fish farmers currently primarily import their uh, feeds for cage farming and you can see that the imported fish between 2015 uh, imported fish feeds between 2015 and 2019 uh, the latest data available has been growing consistently at a, at, at a CAGR of around 25 percent um, and we expect this to still continue as domestic fish feed producers are currently struggling uh, some players are reportedly trying to exit the industry and if you talk to people on the ground, they clearly have uh, failed to compete in terms of the quality, pricing, and farmers really are switching to these imported feeds over the last years to um, be assured of good quality floating feeds. If you, you have also in Uganda many small scale producers with tiny uh, fish feed production on uh, either on farm or others but even the smaller fish fee uh, feed producers have scaled down uh, fish feed production because of the uh, citing usually lack of quality ingredients on the market um, if you talk to the, some of the players they have to import actually all of their feed ingredients especially the, the protein components because the uh, demand for raw materials demand for protein is very high in Uganda and the especially the protein component, there is, a, there is a lack of at the moment. So we see people importing soy and, and other products um, to get their, pro, their production right. And of course, this is raising the cost of um, domestic produced feed, will hinder also development of local production. But nonetheless, in the coming years, we do expect that there will be localization of feed production. There's quite some strong signals in the market that there are indeed players looking to set up uh, fish feed production. And we really think that if that happens, we've identified this as one of our key opportunities to develop this sector, it will really push the sector to the next level. So you now really see that this um, sector is still dependent upon imports and costs of these feeds have risen dramatically over the last year with all the, the disruptions in, in transport and, and what have you. It's uh, domestic production would really make it uh, far more uh, resilient. And I think one thing that's very good to understand um, if you're talking about the Ugandan aquaculture uh, market is to understand the international trade and route to market dynamics. Uh, Louisa just mentioned already about the importance of exports 
uh, to the industry. Um, when we were talking to farmers throughout the industry, um, they were reported that over 60%, 67% of all agriculture production in um, Uganda is actually exported primarily to the Kenya, to the DRC. So quite a little, um, a small proportion currently still stays within um, the, the country and most of it is exported. Now, about 17%, 20% is exported directly by farmers, whereas the rest, so about 50% of this, this export um, is sold to traders who mainly sell in export market hubs, such as Busia Market or uh, Bunaganga with the DRC, where the trade is happening as well. And where farmers export to generally depends primarily upon their location, right? Western Uganda will export towards uh, the DRC, whereas Eastern Uganda will export more towards uh, Kenya. So while it is generally uncommon for farmers to directly export, usually through traders, we do see some of the few large scale farmers actually having distribution networks all the way into Kenya, all the way into other regions, uh, cutting out the middlemen and enjoying a larger margin. Um, trading towards major cities in the in the Congo, as you know, the Congo is a big market within East Africa. Used it, you know, so to, so to big cities such as Goma used to take place through Rwanda. If you go back uh, about a decade or or so, however, uh, the border was closed for quite some time between Rwanda and Uganda, so that redirected trade through Tanzania or through other elements, but that border is reopened now. So we can really see pro probably this trade picking up again, this trade route coming into play again as well. And that would open up significant uh, opportunities for the uh, agriculture market again in Uganda. Um, traders supplying Kenya generally source from these uh, cage farms. An average farm gate price of around 2.3 USD. This was in the fall of last year. It might have changed at this point. Um, and then sell onwards within Kenya at a, at a price of about 2.4, 2.5 USD. Um, they tend to add about uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 um, USD before selling onwards. Uh, similar, those trading towards the, the Congo sell uh, buy at farm gate at a similar price and then sell um, onwards within the Congo for about 260. And what we see is that there is quite a limited number of the larger export players. So quite a limited number of the traders that actually have the capabilities to export quite a lot. And that grants them quite some considerable market power within the sector. And especially towards the smaller pond farmers and the small uh, scale cage farmers. The, the traders, who export prefer to source from uh, cage farms and their ability to bypass traders puts these m larger uh, cage farmers in a much better negotiation position. So we really see the traders having a preference for cage farm fish uh, and the larger cage farmers have a negotiation position, but the smaller ones are generally dependent upon the whims of the, the um the traders and as a result we also see that the smaller players get don't get the same price for their fish as some of the larger players really again going back to that dual sector that is coming uh, that is emerging within the industry and we can see a similar dynamic when we look at the market power and route to a market on the domestic market itself as well uh, where we really see that the pond farmers tend to get lower prices for their fish than cage farmers uh, this is both due to their, to their lower volumes, but also due to the uh, taste, perceived taste. People perceive cage farm fish to be uh, of a better taste than, than uh, pond farm fish. And we see especially that they get lower prices because of their lower volumes. And I'll try to explain this dynamic just in a bit more. Um, what we see, of course, is the traders, they plan their routes dependent upon the quantities that they uh, expect to get from the different farms that they have to visit. Um, they incur costs, hiring trucks, ice, all based upon these, these estimates that we see. And then we see that pond farmers actually overestimate the production or might not have their production. And uh, this unreliability, which is far less present on cage farms and the lower volumes makes it that 
uh, traders only want to buy pond farm fish at this moment. Lower price and biases them to buy cage farm fish. Again, a dynamic promoting cage farm over others. In terms of overall pricing, we see a price between $2.60, $2.70 on the domestic market. But that is of your general uh, consumption. We actually had so, see so that some of these larger players that we mentioned before, Source of the Nile, Yaledo, that have integrated uh, outlets where they sell premium fish, are able to get uh, significantly higher prices, selling between $2.07 and, and, and $3.30 uh, um, on the market. So they actually get a significantly higher price than most of this uh, might get on the market through their integration, of course, but also because they're actually putting premium quality fish out on the market. And then, of course, when we're talking about the really small segment, the smaller substance farmers, uh, that this picture doesn't really apply to them. They have small volumes. They might sell at an auctions locally, and they might be able to get bigger, better prices because of these smaller volumes and because they can wait and find a better consumer. But this is more of those that are trying to put in more of a commercial uh, business where we really see that the cage farmers get a better price. The bigger ones are able to leverage some of their integration uh, to get a, a premium product on the market as well. And then finally, if we look at the catfish, we've, this is again just mostly talking about tilapia because that's dominant. But if we look at catfish, we can see that the farm gate price is considerably lower uh, because of its lower popularity, lower market demand. Catfish kilogram ra uh, ranges between at farm gate level between 1.5 USD and 2.6 USD. And if you you would say, okay, if in uh, Uganda there is no demand, perhaps you can export to the Congo where there is a significant demand for catfish, but these require these larger catfish and we're really seeing farmers struggling to produce the size of catfish that traders towards the, uh, the Congo demand and which would allow them to get a better price. So really in practice, we're seeing quite low small catfish and we're seeing quite low prices as well. This is sort of the route to market um, where we see quite a lot of export. We see domestically that some players are trying to develop the, uh, the market and actually getting a premium for their fish. And we see that cage farm fish is preferred over pond farm fish and that these structural challenges will likely also make it difficult for pond farming to develop without actual very strong uh, interventions, but that cage farming is probably poised to develop uh, significantly. Uh, Louisa just mentioned it already. And there is a new bill coming up um, uh, as well for aquaculture. And there's a number of relevant aquaculture uh, laws and regulations that we want to present to you. So, um, Louisa, could I ask you to del delve a bit deeper into the regulatory framework that we have and this new bill that's coming up? All right. So in terms of the bill, so we have a bill that is currently with Parliament. Um, they're currently speaking to stakeholders about one or two things before they pass it. But uh, because um, the fish farming, you know, utilizes land and other resources, we have quite a number of relevant um, acts that are present. And this really shows that there's been a consistent effort to, to have the right regulations in place. As I speak about the fisheries and aquaculture bill of 2020, um, it is important to note that this is also going to be aligning with Uganda's agro-industrialization agenda. So they're looking So that definition is not yet um, um, explained. But uh, what the district officials have mentioned is that the, the ministry officials have mentioned is that this is really, you know, simple tasks like removal of intestines, removal of the scales, some kind of packaging, because once you increase the shelf life of the fish, then it is definitely able to access more markets or um, markets further than Kenya, DRC and Rwanda. Um, the current concern, though, with the actors of the core actors is the potential loss of key markets. Um, it is seen that uh, Kenya and DRC have a preference for the whole and fresh fish. 
and increasing the processing costs might have an impact on their current earnings and profit. Uh, but we can't anticipate what this is going to cause, but we know that because of the conversations that are happening currently, we hope to see that uh, a win-win situation is realized. Um, in terms of um, other regulations or um, you know, laws or incentives that we have in, in country, we're seeing that the GMO bill um, that was um, put at the table is also currently going through um, some kind of vetting, mainly to see what is the impact, what's going to be the impact of introducing um, certain commodities, especially for you know soy and other protein, plant protein sources. Um, I can't speak to the fact whether it shall be passed, but I know that uh, th there's been indications in the market that this needs to be passed sooner rather than later because of the implications it's, it's having on the agricultural sector. Um, we see them, we see a push also to introduce more improved varieties um, that would be improved varieties of uh, commodities that are raw materials for feed production. We also see um, other development programs uh, setting up, you know, aquaculture parks in, in two places currently, uh, Apache and Kalangala. We also see uh, other regulations coming in place to see how we can also restore certain wetlands that had been reclaimed for other activities. And all this is really hinged on what the, the fish fisheries bill is bringing on board. I think that's it. And maybe to speak to the incentives and uh, sub subsidies, but uh, maybe that I could respond to in terms of the questions that might come after this. But over to you, T. Thank you, Louisa. Very interesting. We we lost you a bit at the at the start, but I think uh, key is to see how this uh, this fisheries and agriculture bill will play out uh, in the in the coming period and that there is really good ongoing discussion between the government and, and the and different sector stakeholders to make sure that it's a win-win. Do I summarize it correctly at that level? Yes, absolutely. Superb. Um, within our sector, the report, we identified uh, different opportunities for further uh, development, really for this, also for this uh, the small and medium, but in the sector in a whole as well. Um, these are described in a bit more detail in the report. Um, we've put them here too, but we would really like to hear also from everyone present here today, because we know this is only our view, what we've presented, and we've tried to do our best. We're, we're certain that there, um, we don't know everything. Um, we would really like to hear what you think is needed to develop the sector forward, to bring an uh, agriculture sector forward in Uganda, to grow it and to have it an equitable and inclusive growth uh, in the coming period. So please let us know in the chat as well what you would say. Uh, we believe that if we, the key are um, interventions towards feed, to make sure that there's localized production of feed and that there's actually affordable feed. So we're also looking at the raw material sites. We see critical uh, bottlenecks in fingerlings, in knowledge throughout the sector. We think the domestic consumer market can be grown and that the actors are already doing that well, but that we can invest more in that, that it should be uh, supported through perhaps some, some public programs as well. Um, for many, as you know, the cost of financing is, is significant um, and a lack of insurance in a high risk sector as, as uh, aquaculture is also a key bottleneck. Um, and those market dynamics that we just mentioned previously uh, can perhaps be resolved through some form of farmers association unifying bodies giving these smaller farmers also market power so these are some of the the opportunities we identified um, more detail in the report but we'd love to hear what you have as well and with us today is also uh, the embassy of the Netherlands uh, in Uganda Frank um, Frank can we ask you what your view is on the sector, what the views of the embassy on the opportunities in this market and how the embassy supports you Dutch and Ugandan businesses in actually capitalizing on the opportunities present in the market? Sure. Are you able to hear me uh, well? Fantastic. Uh, good afternoon and good morning, everyone. Um, 
Yeah, my name is Frank Bowser, agricultural councillor for Uganda, Rwanda, and we uh, commissioned this uh, roadmap uh, together with RBO uh, a while ago, and uh, uh, we have done that because uh, we see the potential of the sector, the growth in the sector, um, and um, we have a few priority sectors that we are already uh, engaged in in uh, Uganda, uh, specifically horticulture, dairy, uh, potatoes, uh, and poultry, um, and uh, we are working on a new uh, multi-annual strategy for the coming years. So we thought it was good input to have a, a clear vision on uh, on what's happening in uh, in aquaculture and fisheries in Uganda to be able to uh, well to to uh, to define our uh, our activities and our efforts to contribute to uh, to development in the sector. And to also involve uh, um, the, the Dutch uh, players in the sector together with the uh, Ugandan uh, um, uh, uh, companies. Um, so, uh, yeah, in that sense, this roadmap is a, is, a, is a good input for us, and also good that we're discussing it now with you, uh, with the uh, with the, with the sector, to get uh, to get your inputs and your ideas. And I see a lot of questions in the chat that are interesting. I think also to to discuss. Uh, Later on in this uh, in this webinar, um, um, so yeah, that, 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 and, and I really want to thank um, uh, Lariva uh, and uh, Asigma for uh, for doing a good job because I think the data on uh, on several uh, aspects of the sector are brought forward uh, in, a, in a good way. You know, the figures uh, that are available cannot always be. Uh, uh, Trusted <laughs> to to say it uh, bluntly. Uh, so I think it's good to to counter check and to have the practical uh, information updated and uh, and and have, a, have and in that sense a good good situation in which you uh, well uh, set up uh, efforts that are based on the on the right uh, on the right information. Um, so that uh, said, we have. Uh, Quite a few uh, instruments that um, that are available also in the follow-up of the roadmap because the roadmap uh, that we uh, commissioned is is part of our strategy at the embassy. We have uh, we have done the same in the potato sector and in the poultry and piggery sector. We first commissioned um, a roadmap to have a clear understanding of the sector, what's going on, what are the challenges and uh, and the opportunities. Uh, and then be able to to come up with follow up uh, activities and follow up efforts. So we we do that ourselves at the embassy. So we have the correct information to be of help for uh, everyone who wants to further expand and be involved in the sector. But we also have some instruments at uh, at RVO uh, who are um, which are available for companies that want to invest individually. But we also have some consortium uh, financing. Uh, Programs which uh, have also been applied here in uh, in in poultry and in dairy in Uganda. So in, in those projects, uh, companies from the Netherlands and Uganda cooperate to work on uh, on uh, taking away challenges of the sector and also have an entry to do further business in the sector. And that that works quite well. We've done so in aquaculture also together with uh, Larif in Rwanda as well, where we have. Uh, Quite a state-of-the-art um, uh, fish farm being erected now and um, and being launched in October, so that's really exciting. So in this sector, I really see the opportunities with some Dutch presence already uh, to, to further stimulate that, but also involve companies, organizations that are present in the region but uh, might not be so active in Uganda yet. I think Uganda is a growing market, as we, as we have been shown. So, um, uh, looking forward to uh, to be of help uh, for all that want to uh, uh, also in the follow up of this webinar to to take it forward and uh, and uh, and jointly uh, look at the opportunities to set up practical uh, follow up of this roadmap. So, I think I'll leave it there for now and uh, give it back to Tim. I expect. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Frank. Really good to hear your vision. Thank you for commissioning this research. I think with the number of participants present today, we can see that there's clear interest. Um, and we hope that uh, that they will find their way to you uh, for any follow-up as well, uh, for yeah, any support yeah, that yeah, might yeah, be needed. Yeah, please. That, that, that's good that you mentioned that, Tim, because we have uh, not only our agricultural office, Heidi is my colleague sitting next to me, uh, 
we are part of the, of the by the Ministry of Agriculture, Nature and Food Quality assigned uh, team in Kampala. We also have a trade and investment and uh, economic cooperation team, Jeroen Flutters and Stephen Bayit. And then we also have a food security uh, team, Joseph Abia Waranga and Hans Raadschilder. So we have quite, uh, as private sector development and food security are really important themes for our embassy. So we're really here to, uh, to help and to be in touch uh, with you about uh, your further uh, efforts, questions and uh, needs for assistance. So yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. With that, uh, I think uh, I see full chat and uh, and quite some questions with that we would like to close off the presentation and move towards the, the Q&A. Uh, Laura, I think you have collected some questions perhaps for uh, for the research team or other people present today. Yes, I do have collected. Thank you, Tim. Um, one of the first questions is who are the main foreign investors in cage farming other than Sonor Yalelo? We see a few, and Louise, perhaps you you can uh, you can add to that. We can see a few uh, Indian foreign investors. We can see some some Chinese foreign investors as well. If we move towards um, this, we we can see that uh, parties such as IG Invest. I think those are actually from Chinese foreign origin, and, and Victoria Treasures more from an Indian origin. So there's there's investment um from europe but there's also investment from the asian uh continent coming in um louisa would you want to add to that um not necessarily uh, maybe just to say that we also have um ugandan farms that are also growing into what you would consider large investors as well that's all i would say yeah, that, that's a very good point uh, there. I think that quite some of the growth is being driven actually by Ugandan investment. Quite some uh, people that might, might have earned their money in other businesses and seen opportunity in agriculture. And that is one of the significant drivers as well within the sector. So it's not only foreign investment, it's definitely also domestic investment that's coming into uh, the uh, uh, cage farming sector. So to what extent are fish pond and fish producers in Uganda interested in probiotics? I think right now, I mean, it, uh, it's, it's difficult. We didn't ask them uh, directly, but what we do see is that the level of professionalism is quite low. Right. So there's very little water quality testing still going on, very little knowledge of the importance of uh, water quality still going on, and especially this pond farming sector. So these, um, as of course, if you would want to go in towards items such as probiotics, there would have to be an understanding of why it is necessary and why this is needed. Um, and for that, that's one of the reasons why we would say that there's really a need for uh, ed increased education and um, increased training of farmers. Louisa, perhaps you can shed a bit more light on how the pond farmers, how they currently operate and how they have some of their, uh, where do they obtain their knowledge? Okay, so pond farming is uh, encouraged by the government through different development programs. And typically the farmers uh, depend on the district fisheries of FISA to give them guidance on, you know, the structure of the pond, um, how much to buy, what to buy, but they do not have the equipment or the technical know-how to know the details required in managing the farm. In terms of feed and um, inputs, uh, most of them have started feed that has been given by the government again, Open Wealth Creation. Um, and once the starter feed uh, is complete, um, they typically tend towards other sources, so food waste um, and sometimes purchase commercial feed, but mainly will sell it off if they're not able to sustain the inputs required to, to farm fish. So in short, I think looking at the current situation of pond farming, probiotics might be uh, a step uh, of uh, yeah development a bit a bit too far. I don't think the demand would be really high, but that's my personal opinion. All right. So another question is: How much is it estimated that cage farming can grow, especially looking at the carrying capacity of the water sources, the ecological status, and the eutrophication of the water sources? 
That's a very interesting question. Um, actually, it really ties into some of the work that the FAO is currently doing. At the moment, the FAO, through a major development program called the EU Truefish, is actually looking at the carrying capacity of the lake and zoning and all those elements. Because right now, it is not very well established what are some of these um carrying capacities and such. Of course, Uganda has by far the biggest part of the lake. But if we look at a Kenya, uh, which has a smaller part of the lake, but has seen rapid agriculture development, we're already seeing quite some competition for um, the lake resources. We're already seeing quite some uh, negative effects, also localized negative environmental effects, but uh, there nonetheless. So right now, we see, you know, it's difficult to say what the total carrying capacity is of the lake and how that growth can be um, um, achieved or, or what, what is the total maximum. We still think it's it's definitely more than what is here now. And if you take the um, the figures that some, some scientists has put out, it, it's just a fraction of what we possible. But it's really good that the FAO is actually working on this to establish a good number, to put zoning in place so that the right sites are there. Um, and that that would lead to uh, development that will, but in growth that will work a lot. And we actually also see around uh, some areas where the site selection wasn't done very properly. People started and then they moved away again. Uh, like this had to stop because of because of the wrong site selection, uh, not not uh, you know not being in, in deep enough waters or not enough flow of, of current. So we're seeing uh, that. Luisa, would you have anything to add to that? Absolutely. I, I just wanted to also add the fact that it is only a small portion of the lake is currently occupied. Even with those who have received licenses, they are not fully utilizing the space that they have set up for. So definitely we can see um, growth happening in Uganda and definitely uh, higher than what you would see in Kenya and in Tanzania. So right now it doesn't seem to be a constraining factor but in the future it's definitely a, a case and it's good that people are already thinking in it and we will we will hope that that actually goes into a proper regulation of the sector to, to drive the growth in the right way but we'll have to see how that develops over the coming years another question is how the availability is of small fry in juvenile feeds and the high quality broodstock feeds in uganda um so of the smaller feeds again uh, what we know it's all imported right so you have uh, quite some imports um there are feeds available especially again uh, some some players such as uh, uh Kafika have feeds available uh, perhaps not for all the sizes that might be required of the fish but there are some available um and uh, that I think is the most I can say about that, that there are imports and some distributors of, of different starter feeds and, and broodstock feeds, um, but perhaps not the full range you might expect in some other more developed uh, markets. Anything to add to that, Louisa, in terms of the starter feeds? I think maybe also on Afrokai. Um, no, I, I think there were two domestic um, producers but uh, currently Africa holds the contract for government to provide the starter feed for the uh, Ugandans but, uh, participating in pond culture. Um, but it's also to a, a smaller scale. What we've heard is that a lot of this is actually imported and then packaged and sold. So it, it, they, there's barely anything in country. And there's def this is definitely an area we would want to see some kind of investment in. And in general, Louisa, how is it the, the availability of feed uh, in the country uh, if you're looking a bit further away from, from Lake Victoria? Um, so looking away from Lake Victoria or the center of, of Uganda, uh, a lot of them have to purchase from center, from central Uganda. So sometimes they purchase the feed from the district fisheries officers. So once they're buying fingerlings, they also have to have um, a slot of space to carry on inputs. Um, most of the stores that are based up country only uh, provide feed on demand. And most times that's not the case. For those who have larger sized farms, what they've opted to do is actually import uh, from Zambia, Egypt, uh, Brazil, South America, so that they have a consistent um, flow for feed.
All right. So another question is if catfish is also exported, and where to if? So what we see is that any export that is there is going towards uh, primarily towards the Congo, the, to the Roche DRC. But what we really see, and we alluded to it a bit in the presentation, is that um, the demand there is there for these bigger sized catfish, right? These bigger catfish of, of 700 gram plus. And right now we are seeing farmers struggling to produce these uh, big catfish due to farm management practices, due to uh, lack of grading and all sorts of other activities and the long time that I might need. So we're actually seeing that farmers are only able to grow them until two, 300 gr grams. So that is uh, uh, not allowing them to actually export a lot of catfish um, and thus also hindering the market. Congo would be the market to go to for catfish. Um, but it, it's quite limited so far, what we're seeing. Am I, did I misinterpret anything, uh, Louisa? Or, uh... um, not necessarily. I, I just wanted to add to the, the fact that, yes, um, for those who are farming fit, catfish in, in uh, commercial sizes, you'll actually have traders coming all the way to the farm to purchase this catfish. Um, and as Tim has mentioned, the inability to produce the catfish at m to the largest size and mass produce is mainly because of technical challenges, which can be resolved to be able to help them produce. Um, the third thing I would mention about catfish is because it's not consumed um, in large quantities by Ugandans, it's also one a reason why there's maybe not so much of that production spread across the country, but uh, DRC is known for consuming it both fresh and dried and we definitely are exporting to them right now. Walter, are you trying to mention something? We can't hear you, Walter. All right. <laughs> are there any further maybe, questions? Maybe you can put your comments in the chat, Walter, so we know what you wanted to say. So yeah, there are quite some more questions and we have still some time left. So I think we'll just continue with the questions. Another question was if there are any import restrictions on especially agriculture material and for example, high quality tilapia broodstock as well. Louisa, could I give this question to you as, a, as an expert? Absolutely. So there are no um, import challenges with that, as I had mentioned. Uh, all agricultural inputs or raw materials into inputs are actually exempted from tax. So you should be able to bring those across the border if you can provide clear indication on why um, you are bringing this in. This is also an example. This also goes to show the reason why uh, farmers are actually importing their own feed. Because once you do the numbers, it might be cheaper to import the feed from um, outside countries than to purchase it from those who are providing it in country. And in terms of live broodstock, uh, as I understand it, it is currently not possible to get a permit to get live broodstock into the country, right? Of a new strain. Um, yes, it's not possible. It is also mentioned as by some of the stakeholders as one of the key constraints. We had some discussions and some people are really trying to import new strains, but they're unable to. Um, and they, they would believe that that would really further the sector. Uh, we've had some conversations with some actors who are at least share uh, having trouble. So I'm not cons completely sure about the, the legal framework or whether it would be possible or not. But I do know that many of the players that were actually wanting to import it have been unable so far. All right, thank you. So someone mentions that in other East African countries, frozen tilapia is competing with locally produced fish. Is this also the case in Uganda? And how is that in Uganda? Um, please add to this uh, what we see a bit later uh, or to this, to this uh, Louise. But what we've really been seeing for, we've been looking at some of these import flows really in previous studies. And what we've really been seeing is those, those tend to uh, avoid um, 
Uganda because of the lower prices there. There's quite a significant wild catch that they haven't really been able to get a foothold as they've been able to get in Dar es Salaam, as they've been able to get in Nairobi, as they've been able to get growingly more and more in Kigali in, in, in Rwanda. So if you look at this, those flows historically, it's less present in uh, Kampala because of the predominance of uh, cheap wild catch what used to be the main, main competitor. Louisa has that changed in the recent years. Do we see a lot of imports of, for example, Asian fish, uh, maybe mackerel, tilapia? Um, do you see that on the market? Uh, no, um, I, I, I'm just thinking of two things. The fact that I think we, we have some inputs from Kenya and China, but those are less than you know 50 metric tons in the data that we saw, number one. Number two, we already have low demand um, and, and we have this at a cheaper price produced in country. It might not make sense to actually import um, from the neighboring countries. So the, the volumes are quite small. It's nothing significant as compared to what we are actually farming in country. So you really, you know, as a landlocked country and uh, Uganda, transport is also relatively expensive to get to Kampala. So, so far historically, um, the high wild catch has actually stopped and the lower prices has actually stopped many of them importing, at least as what we've been observing while being along in the sector. It could have changed and could have been flows that we don't see, but that's generally how we, we observe it in, in, in Uganda. Yeah, and current export prices uh, from China to Africa have, of course, dramatically uh, gone up uh, due to all the COVID-related uh, logistical costs. So this is also making it harder for exporters from China um, who are more local market focused now than they were five, six years ago. Um, plus, product has to come all the way from Mombasa or Dar es Salaam through to Uganda. So you got to factor in these transport costs as well, making it less attractive, if you will, than prior. Another question is, can the number of productive hatcheries provide a growing market in Uganda? We clearly see this as one of the main development opportunities, right? So additional hatcheries or main players growing the hatchery and setting this up for third par parties, we really see if the small and medium segments, you know, the type of farmers that aren't able to run their own hatchery, uh, if a new hatchery would come in or multiple, because it's such a huge country, it would really benefit the sector. It's a key bottleneck mentioned by many of the farmers. Catfish and tilapia, uh, both there, it's a key bottleneck mentioned. And we really think that more hatcheries would really benefit the sector. But of course, uh, what you do see is that it, in terms of the market for fingerlings, it's rather difficult to establish a hatchery um, because farmers... Uh, only order fingerlings a uh, short time before they actually need it. So it's not a very long time. They wouldn't say in a few months I need fingerlings. It's next week or ne uh, over two weeks. Uh, demand might fluctuate as well over uh, over time. So quite some players entering and exiting the market. So it's not necessarily an easy market to start a dedicated uh, hatchery for fingerling production. But I think that's, that's there for most of uh, East Africa. But the demand is there. The need is there. Quality is, is required, um, and it would really benefit the sector. Thank you for the ex extensive answer. Another question is, how does the aquaculture sector look towards the possibilities of using insect protein as a source of fish feeds? Louisa, would you be able to share some light on this? Would you know anything from, uh, from the field? Um, sorry, I was uh, muted. Um, I, I think that the, the, we've seen certain farmers, mainly those who are running mixed farms, attempt to use the black fly, black uh, soldier, soldier fly, fly. larva. Yeah, uh, but they're constrained mainly by the high price that is attached to them. Um, so currently, it's only those who are doing it for a scientific purpose or out of passion, but we, we don't see them tending to it. But if anything, we would want to see them, you know, professionalize and actually using commercial feed for the start. And hopefully in the coming years, if that becomes a, a feasible option for us, we might um, take it on as a Ugandan. 
Um, and maybe to add to that, uh, of course, it's very much a price question. Huh? How open are feed manufacturers yeah. is very much getting to volume and driving down the price of BSF. That being said, um, ourselves included, uh, several trials are being included for tilapia feeds in cage farming using BFS additives. So anything that can be produced as an alternative to the ongoing proteins being used um, is interest is interesting once it gets to volume and once it gets to attractive cost price from a feed manufacturer's perspective. Um, I think the openness and the willingness of the major feed producers to look into this sector is very, very clear on the line. And again, the core question would be get it up to scale and get it down to a price where it's attractive from a commercial perspective. But the willingness to look into the alternatives is, um, is reiterated by all major feed players. So someone also asked, what are the challenges in relation to the needs of the industry? I think you already elaborated quite a bit on that, Tim, but is there any more you would like to add on that? So if we go a bit back, all of these um, challenges that we, we've seen um, are not necessarily our voice. It's, it's just transferring what we've heard in the sector. Right? So these are the challenges that we've really seen. Um, and that really have been indicated by in all our interviews. We interviewed over 70 people. All, all, they indicated these these challenges. So that's where we based our top interventions um, on. Now, in terms of what the industry would like to see, uh, please, and many of you are here as well. So I think we expressed that earlier as well. So please indicate what you will be seeing as your priority and what you will be seeing as were some of the, the key elements. But in general, we're talking about, you know, we need a growing domestic market, uh, you know, that there we need quality feeds available on the market now. We need um, access to fingerlings, lower cost feeds. Those are some of the main things that we're, we've been seeing. Louisa, is there anything to add to that from your observations or from out, out the field? Um, definitely. I'd like to add just some context to it. So in terms of feed, it's we want high quality feed available and accessible. So across the country, number one. Number two, in terms of the raw materials, uh, what we have in terms of soy, um, can do something, but because soy, for example, is a multi-use commodity, we would need support in developing that area. In terms of fingerlings, we've already mentioned there's only two people, two major ones, that's Rock Springs and um, the, Uganda, the government's um, hatchery. Most others are actually you know, producing their own fingerlings to be able to farm. In terms of the technical expertise along the value chain, as mentioned, the farmers barely have anything. They're depending on the government officials who are stretched to be able to provide services for people, you know, scattered across the district, let's say 140 kilometers apart. It's almost impossible to do this. So how can we, you know, disseminate this information across? That's definitely a challenge. Um, when you think about the dependency on export, it's pretty much because, you know, we, we have not been educated about the value that comes from um, consuming fish. And if we see that, you know, a, a push uh, and this maybe might come from the embassy and, you know, core value chain actors to see how they can increase consumption in that area. When it comes to financing and, and, and insurance, um, for those of you who have done investments in, in Uganda, you will know that the cost of capital for a typical farmer goes up to 38, 40% because of the um, risk. For those who have financing from uh, banks, that's mainly because um, they've borrowed using a different business and, uh, and then putting this into fish farming, which is, is not likely to move the sector up. And, and, and that can also explain the reason why we have quite a few, we only have a few domestic investors because the, the cost of capital is almost impossible. And um, the dynamics uh, team has mentioned this consistently. Uh, farmers, uh, there's barely any um, you know, margin left to the farmer or value that is kept at the farmer level. And we think that by unifying them in some form, shape or way, whether that is a own culture side or cage culture side, it might also increase the what they're able to take away 
in the overall price of a product and the regulation definitely it's in place but we're thinking that there might be some changes to that and adding your voice to this would also definitely do some great push towards it so just the context but indeed the, the challenges are here and they're clearly um, critical investments it's mainly feed and inputs it's technical know-how it's giving the right um, services to move the sector forward thank you so much the context really helped any additional questions, uh, Laura? I've got three questions left. So okay. I think it's perfect with considering the time. So another question is, how does the Ugandan existing aquaculture infrastructure compare to major other producers like Zambia, Kenya, Ghana? So if we take it really towards uh, the Lake Victoria space, um, we're seeing that uh, in terms of, of total ability, like the Uganda has by far the biggest part of the lake, but it's not as much developed as we could see in, in Kenya. So we see a lot more individual smaller farmers in Kenya. So a lot of uh, smaller farmers that really stood up and they're really crowding some of the space. We're also seeing some already existing um, uh, feed production, right? With uh, Unga Skreting already producing feed in country. And if we look then at the Ugandan side, we're seeing quite a uh, few some of these bigger players actually players that have been in the industry for quite a long time like source of the now a long-standing partner of the agriculture sector the players like Yaleo. so some some of these bigger farms but not as many smaller and medium farms that segment is just grown so that might be just lagging behind a bit towards what you would see in, in kenya development might still come and what you're seeing also, right, we're now seeing some very clear indications that there might be feed production coming into Uganda that might be also lagging behind a bit or when that comes, it really comes into play. If we take it towards um, Tanzania, that really, Tanzania really is just starting with its uh, uh, cage culture. The lake was only opened a few years ago prior to what you weren't able to get licenses. The business climate is quite tricky there and the distance to markets from once is also quite there. So that's really in its infancy stage. Um, taking Rwanda, we're seeing increased development, especially on Lake Kivu. So that's growing there. Um, and if you would compare to major players like Zambia, uh, what we're seeing right now happening in Uganda is something that might, resemble a bit of those first stages of development in Zambia as well, where some time ago you saw some of these bigger players actually coming up, Lake Harvest and Yalelo as well, again, so similar names. They started growing and still, and they've been able to expand and actually stay in the game and have significant volumes. But the small and medium segments, apart from small uh, uh, some uh, some players, has not really developed that much if you talk that, uh, to them. So you really... Perhaps Uganda is at this first stage where you're seeing that rift between um, the bigger and the smaller players and they're thus standing on a crossroad in order to make it more towards an Egypt development with a lot of different smaller players. You're going to have to have investments in supportive infrastructure to support small and medium players to get them along too. Uh, um, in order to not just have like a zombie where you have a few bigger ones and the rest isn't really developed. That's sort of our vision, what, uh, what we, the feeling we got when we got around and it's on, based upon our experiences in the entire uh, region as well. Wouter, you've, you've, been told, you've been around as well quite a bit uh, for the last decade. Do you have anything to add to that in, in terms of the position of Uganda in the... In the uh, in the region and its comparison to other countries. Yeah, I think you covered quite a bit. Uh, and um, one of the core drivers going forward will also be that zoning and that regulation. Many of you have direct uh, experience in, in the Kenyan setting, where, of course, you now see the further expansion being closed uh, or shut, no, basically uh, slowed down, if you will, where many uh, ways halted by a lack of, of um, let's say, proper prior zoning. So the expansion opportunities then start to basically slow down. I think this was already uh, mentioned at the World Aquaculture Society Forum 2016 at the time where there was a discussion on how to go about proper zoning of the lake and allowing for commercial operators to have clarity on their investments and certainty that once you get that license for that particular area of the lake, you're sure you don't have any issues with uh, two close neighbors and, um, and, and the risk of uh, disease, of course. 
So those are, uh, I think, key drivers uh, where the industry is today uh, looking forward. And I think Uganda has a lot going for it in terms of its position, the natural resources available, and the ability to really leverage a regional market to many ways uh, as well. DRC was mentioned before. And again, if we have a situation today where fish from as far away as Lake Tukana makes its way all the way to the DRC, then there are certainly producers more close by who could provide for that fish. Um, and if combined with a cold chain, could also be provided fresh rather than dried, which is the typical. So truly, like Tim said, a crossroads for Uganda, um, but a great uh, position to move from, um, provided you know, the different angles within the sector are available. Local feed, local fingerlings, and of course, the topic of genetics um, is an important driver forward as well. I'll hold it here, Tim. Fantastic. Yeah, I think you alluded to one part that is perhaps good to be stressed. In the region, uh, Uganda is one of the main producers of raw materials. As much as we've been talking about the sort of uh, challenges around raw materials, there are two harvests a year, so that's very, very good. There is significant maize production. There is some soy production. Um, so in terms of a position in that sense, if you would compare that to a Kenya, Uganda is in a far better position in terms of raw materials than their neighbor. Uh, most of the maize is actually exported to, to, to that. So in long-term sector development, that might be a real boost if you get local production as well. All right. Uh, another question is, is there an overview of the current costs of imported feeds? Um, at the current cost level, Louisa, would you know what, what the current cost is around the market on on uh, of imported feeds, and I know that changes quite a lot with every month that the import prices changes. But well, would you know a general ballpark figure of, of what the prices were when we were doing this research, and maybe now too, if you have it? I, I think the prices were ranging between one to one point five US dollars per kilogram. Starter feed is more expensive, and the price reduces as the pellet size increases. That's, that's as much as I can remember, but I know that we have this information and we could provide it to them at a later date. Okay. And there's, there's a big thing that you would also have to uh, take into account there. Mm -hmm. You know, the larger, far, larger farmers, they import directly, uh, and that's exempt from taxes. Uh, so they get their mm -hmm. uh, their cost at a significant their feed at a significantly lower cost. Those the farmers that have to buy from distributors that are mm -hmm. actually uh, having to charge taxes uh, on when they resell it. Um, and there's of course the margin taken from from for uh, for the for the distributor. There's a considerable gap there as well. So that that again puts which price you're taking the open market price, the import price, uh, and it's very fluid at the moment because of this, uh, this, yeah, the yeah. disruptions in transport. But thank you, that, that gives you a general recall, indication. Yeah, I think I recall the prices before COVID, it, uh, a, a ton of imported. So the prices I gave one to 1.5 were at retail price. For those that have been imported, it was $700 per ton before COVID. It rose up for those who are importing directly to the farm to about 950, I hope that covers it fantastic thank you um, is there an approximate price point a manufacturer of feed would need to meet in order to be competitive well i think louisa just mentioned some of mm -hmm. those price points so that would yes. be uh be be there but again apart from from just the price point which is really important and louisa also already mentioned a few other things right uh, availability how are you able to get your feed throughout the country, not just in Kampala itself, but throughout the country? Quality. Farmers are looking at some form of quality in, uh, indicators uh, as well, in terms of the, uh, floatability and, and those other elements. And you can add significant value in this market by actually being a, a technical partner, as many of these farmers might not have access to quite some uh, uh, information there is value addition actually by, by building a relationship and, and training people. I think feed supplies can have a really important role. But of course, if you're not competitive in price, no Ugandan farmer is going to buy you. But there, there's, there's more to just the price that I would just like to mention as well. 
Thank you, Tim. Considering the time, I have the last question right now. Did the study see any RAS systems? Louisa, I don't think we've really seen RAS systems. Of course, with, with uh, you know, RAS systems, some of the benefits really would be if you're further away, water bodies that would actually allow you for cage farm, right? The Ross farming is, is somewhat more expensive. So if you could do peri-urban uh, production in Ross systems, neighboring Dar es Salaam, neighboring Nairobi, you might actually have an ability to produce fresh fish close to the market and get a premium there. In Uganda, Kampala is bordering the, mar uh, the, the lake. You can get really fresh fish from the lake with a really good cost price. So in terms of the competitive position in Ross in especially for outgrow right you might get it in in in, uh, in hatcheries but especially ras for outgrow is just really challenging because you have a low cost competitor in terms of of cage which is good right then then the price is lower for for uh, for a fish in some ways as long as cage is associated as well with uh, proper zoning and environmental management and, and all that comes with that as well. That, that's of importance for the long-term sector sustainability. But no, in short, not a lot of RAS observed, uh, not an outgrow, perhaps in some hatcheries, but even that we haven't really seen a lot of free swimming fry and such. So I would like to thank everyone for the great questions. We had quite some questions and I think that sums up that the presentation was very interesting. I've learned a lot. And Tim, I would like to give the floor to you to end the webinar. Thank you so much for everyone being in attendance. It's been a pleasure, really good questions. Louisa, uh, it's always a pleasure to have you here. And uh, this research is fully on your team as well. You've done an excellent job. Um, for anyone who's interested in some more of the background, we have a report available, so please do not hesitate to reach out either to info at larive.com or tim.de.kruif at larive, uh, tim.de.kruif at larive.com, uh, or Laura, who's probably inv uh, invited you. Please reach out for if you would like to receive the, the report. Um, and for any of you who might be actually looking towards Uganda and growing their, uh, their footprint here, investing, um, the team of Asigma and ourselves are here to help you. And we would ha happily continue our conversation um, after this and talk what we can do um, and see, see how we might be able to help with either information or, or support on the ground. Um, thank you for everyone here. Um, and uh, wishing you a very, very good Thursday.